Okay. Let's continue here. Okay, the importance of trustworthiness and incorruptibility. <clears throat> the tremendous importance attributed to honesty and impeccable business dealings finds expression through Tanakh in Tehillim. David, David, David Amelich identifies the, the virtues that ensure eternal life. Who may ascend the mountain of Hashem and who may stand in the face of his sanctity? One with clean hands and pure heart, who has not sworn in vain by my soul and has not sworn deceitfully. Masuda David explained that this expression, clean hands, refers to one whose hands are pure from money that was not earned, that, that, was, that, that was not earned honestly. Whose hands are pure from money that was not earned honestly. And his heart is pure with the fear of Hashem and not in the not the fear of man. Similarly, Rav Acha notes that only such people of integrity are called faithful of the land. That they may dwell with me. And that's from Tehillim. Okay, so let's continue. Yeah, someone who has stolen goods in his possession is distanced from the mountain of Hashem and his holy place. There's tremendous inspiration for this from the concept of sacrifices. The Torah rejects inards of birds from being brought on the altar, but accept those of an animal. This is because an animal is fed from the feed bag. Of its owner, but a bird is nourished by, is by stealing. A person who has stolen goods in his position will not approach the altar of Hashem, uh, will not ascend and will not appear before him, and will that he will be a reward and detested by Hashem. And the Eliyahu Rabbah, the Koshan Mishpat, explains uh, the reasons for placing the obligation to conduct business as the first question in heavenly court. Um, it says, okay, when a person's, okay, it says, yeah, the study of, okay, one's business is not, I heard in the name of my grandfather, this is from the Eliyahu uh, Rabbah, I heard, uh, why is the question asked prior to the question about the study of Torah? I heard in the name of my grandfather, the Gaon Maharsha, that if one's business dealings are not conducted to integrity, then he studied Torah as, as, as a Hirud Hashem, as stated the Gemara Yuma, Yoma. What do people say about him? Woe unto his father who taught him the Torah. And then just one last thing the person's appearance and garb give the impression of someone who observes the Torah and mitzvahs, yet his business dealings are not particularly honest. He researches the Torah way of life. There's no great Chilol uh, Hashem. I'm going to share my screen and explain to you what exactly it is we're talking about. What, ha what happened is there was quite a lot of backwards and forwards yesterday. And I just want to explain to you where we're holding. Okay. Now, what happened was that the Gomorrah had a discussion about how do we calculate pain? In other words, what happens if there's pain that's felt, but there wasn't a permanent injury that would debilitate someone to the extent that they would lose their value as an employee or their value on the slave market? I'd rather use the word an employee. It just makes more sense from today's point of view. So, in other words, is that even considered something that you pay for? If it's not as serious as to cause you permanent injury or even any sort of financial sub uh, substantial loss in earnings in terms of capacity, even on a temporary basis, is pain then a quotient that you can calculate? And is there a link between physical pain and uh, physical damage? Is the one reliant on the other or are they independent? So there's a discussion between Rava and Rav Papa. Now, what's the source? It's in Duff 84. And the source is in Exodus in Shmuel chapter 21, verse 25. And it says, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, and a bruise for a bruise. So initially, when I gave it over to you guys, it sounds confusing because the view of Rava is saying, listen, this is initially what Rebbe says you could have thought. And this is what Hashem comes to teach you. And with uh, Ben Azai, it's the opposite. 
So because we've got so many contradictory opinions, plus with Ralph Papa, it's easier for me to write it down and unpack it, simply because most people, I think, learn better when they read. So Rebbe says, if you read the verse superficially, you could kind of interpret it as just reading the word burn, meaning that you'd pay for pain, irrespective of damages, because burn means it hurts, actually hurts. So you could think you pay for pain, whether they're damages or not. But Hashem, the merciful one, wrote a bruise to teach you that pain is only paid if there's physical damage like a bruise or a wound. Okay? Ben Azai is of the opposite opinion, according to Rafa. And he said, look, if you look at the verse superficially, you would think that the only time you pay for pain is if there's a wound that is associated with that pain. And... Um, Therefore, Hashem, the merciful one, wrote a bruise to teach you that pain is paid whether there's damage or not, independently. Meaning there's no link between the physical damage versus the pain. You pay for pain irrespective if there's physical damage or not. So that's Rava's view. Okay. Now, before we go through Rav Papa's view, does Kevin, does it make sense to you? Because I know you're exhausted. Okay, yeah, so far you pay for the pain regardless of what the damage is. No, no, what, no, that's, what... not, that's not what it's saying at all. It's not what it's saying at all. What it's saying is there's different ways you can interpret the verse. You've got to pick up the nuance. So Rava is saying, look, when you read a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, a bruise for a bruise, a lot of it seems to be repetitive and superfluous, and unnecessary, in fact. So it's saying he's got an interpretation of Rava. And he's, uh, Rava's saying, look, the way we understand the mission is that Rebbe says that if you're looking at it on first glance, uh, you would pay for, uh, for pain irrespective of their damages. But Hashem comes to teach you, the merciful one, that when it re, uh, actually says a bruise for a bruise, a bruise for a bruise, it's saying that pain will only be paid if there's an injury associated with it. In other words, if there's no sustainable injury, there is no pain that is paid. That's according to Rebbe's interpretation of what Hashem claims to teach us. Ben Azar says, when you're looking at the verse superficially, it would say that, uh, you know, you would pay for pain uh, just uh, if there's damage associated. But he said, what Hashem comes to teach you is that you pay for pain whether or not there's physical damage to your body. So Ben Azai is opposite to Rebbe here. So again, bottom line is Rebbe uh, comes to teach you that pain is paid only if there's damage. Ben Azai is coming to teach you, according to Rava, that whether there's damage or not, you pay for pain. According to Rava. Does that make sense, Kev? They're different. They're absolutely different. Guys? I'm just looking at the text. That's uh, I'm just looking at it. Uh... Arthur Gavin, do you want to give me some feedback, please? Yeah, I'm fine. I understand it. Okay, yeah, oh, sorry, mate. I'm just talking to my client. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just busy at the moment. Sorry. All right. Sorry, sorry. Sure. So then, uh, Kevin R Rava has got a different view to Rav Papa. So Rav Papa says completely the opposite. He said, look, it's far more believable to uh, believe Rebbe's opinion to the contrary because he's the one that redacted the Mishnah. So obviously it makes more sense to attribute our Mishnah to him rather than Ben Azai because Ben Azai is the protagonist. Rebbe is the one whose main opinion it's focused on. So Rebbe says, according to Rav Papa, at first glance you would interpret payment for pain only with an injury because of the word burn and bruise, that the two are associated with each other. So therefore, Hashem taught us, the merciful one, that a bruise at the end of the verse is implicit of the fact that um, pain is pain irrespective, because if the bruise is at the end, it means if there's a bruise, okay, so you pay for pain, sure. But even if there's no bruise, it mentions uh, a burn first, and burn is the, the if somebody says you feel burnt, that's the pain side. So the payment of pain is paid irrespective of whether there's an injury or not. 
But Ben Azai is saying that, um, you know, upon superficial reading, it would seem that you pay for pain irrespective. But Hashem has come to teach us that the whole reason that the word bruise is written is because pain is paid only if it's a physical manifestation of the wound. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Physical manifestation of, of the of of the of the of the of uh, the assault of the uh, of the okay. uh, action. So Gavin, what is we're gonna focus more on rough papa than rubber because it just makes a bit more sense that uh, um, the main focus would be on Rebbe, who redacted the Mishnah. And that's, what is the bottom line of what Rebbe says? What is the bottom line of Brother Zaya? What, what did they say? Who is speaking to Kevin? To you, Kev. Me. Well, Kevin, do you want to try first? Otherwise, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Are you going to try? You give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try. Uh, so, um, is it rubber? Uh, uh, well, there's right. rubber. Hang on. Das is rubber explaining Rebbe and Ben Azai. Then there's rough Okay, so it's explaining, explaining Rebbe. So let me see if that's fine. Let's, I just need a, a clue there. So, so Rebbe, Rebbe, in essence, is saying that there has to... There has to, in order for for there to be payment, there has to be a bruise associated, a bruise and injury associated with the with the pain. So that's 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 his his opinion. And Zaya is saying that it's not necessary. Um, he initially said that. I think he seems to change his mind now in this thing. That's why I actually wanted to ask you a question, but I'll answer this anyway. He initially said, I think, on your previous page that. Uh, he was of the opinion, well, he said, actually, I think he said superficially, so he did qualify himself. He said superficially, it appears as if uh, there's no need for you, that, because pain becomes before, um, pain pain comes before the bruise. Bruise is right at the end. So because bruise is right at the end, it, the pain is, uh, the pain comes like, from heat or something like that. It comes prior to, to an, necessarily having an injury. Uh, so, so, so you pay. In, in in his opinion, you pay irrespective whether there's bruising or not. All right. So what I want to do is unpack this in a simple way. I've thought about it, and the basic thing is in your head to keep in mind. Uh, Shmuel chapter twenty one verse twenty five. Okay, and it basically says a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound a bruise for a bruise. Now, when you keep that in mind, everything else makes sense. Okay, that's the first way to learn it. Then the second way I don't want you to learn it, though, is to see what the initial thought is and what the thought is now. Because that's only going to confuse you. Because then you've got four opinions. You've got Ravas, in terms of what uh, Rebbe initially thought you would have thought, and Ben Azai, what you initially would have thought you would have thought, and then what you actually think. And then you've got Rav Papa's the opposite with the initial thought and the afterthought. That is way too confusing for anybody to uh, uh, remember with reasonability. So what I want to do now is just bottom line focus. Since the Mishnah was redacted by Rebbe, it makes sense to go with Rav Papa's explanation according to the Gemara. So let's not see what they thought you would have thought. Let's see what Hashem taught. Does that make sense? And then you've got very simple two opinion. To me, that makes a lot more sense in terms of how to learn this, to keep it in your mind. Otherwise, it's just going to end up in chaos and confusion. Give me one second. I'm putting my phone on airplane mode. Okay. So, guys, um, if you look at the screen, um, the mercy, according to Rav Papa, Rebbe said the mercy for one wrote a bruise at the end of the verse. So payment for pain is made irrespective of injury or damage. That's what I want you to bear in mind. According to Rav Papa, that's the version we're going with, not Rava. Okay, we're not going. We're not going with. Oh God! And how many times I put phones on on. Uh, 
uh, airplane mode and other phone links. Sorry, guys, I apologize. Okay, guys, have I got your attention? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so we're not going to go according to Rafa because that's just going to add confusion. And we're not going to say what the initial um, conclusion you would have come to at first glance. Bottom line, Rebbe said that uh, payment is made irrespective of injury for pain. So whether or not there's injury or damage or not, you pay for pain, according to Rebbe. That's what Hashem comes to teach us. And Ben Azar is saying that we only pay for pain if there's a wound. Isn't that an easier way to remember it than the whole argument? Yeah. All right, good. Fine. Then there's this whole issue, guys, about this concept of a generalization, specialization. So generally, when you have a clow and then a prat, what does it come to teach you, guys? Gav? You've got a, say again, a clow and a prat. You've got a clow, which is a generalization, and a prat, a specification. What specification. Is, you know, what is that coming to teach you? Uh, so it's teaching you that you, it's giving you the the category that it kind of wants, wants to home in on. So, but it's a, it's a bit general. Then it's going onto a deeper level, more specific within that category. And therefore, and it's coming in on that specific thing. Therefore, uh, what do you mean by therefore? Therefore, how do you how do you learn something? Give me an example. Any example. Ah, uh, okay. I want to think of an example. Um, so I can't think of one offhand. All right. So let's I'll just I'll say... Pass, yeah, but I mean, I'm in the right direction. Yeah, 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 you are. So generalization means uh, two sets of animals were saved in the ark, okay? A male and a female. And the next statement is kosher animals. So we know it goes from non-kosher animals to specifically uh, it's saying that there were seven pairs of kosher animals. So the generalization is a set of all animals were saved. But animals for carbonus uh, were the only the kosher animals. So when you go from the generalization to specification, it funnels in. And then it focuses purely on the specification. Now the question arises here, what do you do if there is a um, gap in between or words in between a generalization and a specification? And let's see where it relies. If you look at the screen, we've got a burn for a burn. Okay, uh, that's a generalization. Why? It's talking about pain in general. Then you're talking about uh, a bruise for a bruise. That shows a specific ramification of the pain focused on an injury. Can you see that? And the Gemara wants to know, what do we do with a wound and a wound? Which is in between a burn for a burn and a bruise for a bruise. So we're going from a generalization, a burn for a burn, to a, a specification, a bruise for a bruise. What happened? Does it mean that a wound for a wound interferes with the flow? And therefore, we don't say, because if you want to say that it doesn't interfere with the flow, the ramification is, if it starts off as pain and ends off as an injury, you only pay for pain if there's an injury. If um, the wound for a wound breaks the generalization to specification, it means you pay for pain irrespective of if there's an injury or not. Can you see that, guys? Because the two subjects are not linked. So we need to know whether or not to learn a generalization to a specification if there's words between. That's what we want to know. Diamond. Yeah. Yeah. To a burn for a burn to me would be a, uh, would be specific. A wound for a wound could be general. Well, I agree with Kevin there, actually, because a wound could be a general wound. And in fact, a bruise seems in a certain way a little bit more specific. In other words, it's a congealment of blood under the skin when that skin hasn't broken. So to me, it seems quite specific, a bruise for a bruise. A wound for a wound is pretty general. And a burn for a burn is pretty uh, a specific type of pain, actually, if you think about it. It's, it's to do with the uh, fire. But be that as it may, Kevin, I agree with you. 
The Gomorrah sees a burn for a burn as a general description of pain, whereas a bruise for a bruise specific in terms of the type of injury. So how how do they interpret it? Uh, Rebbe and ben have that's where they have the argument. This is an alternative explanation of the Gomorrah, of the generalization specification. So Rebbe holds that uh, uh, that it's uh, if it's distant, in other words, the words between the generalization and the specification, if there's a words in between, like a wound for a wound, you actually ignore that principle. And what does that mean? Is that pain is not linked to damage. So you pay for pain whether or not there's damage or not. Ben Azai is saying that we still go from the general to specific, even when there are words in between. Okay, and the reason being for the answer that Kevin said, you could say a, a burn for a burn then goes into the general, a wound for a wound, uh, and then a bruise for a bruise, linking the general concept of pain to the specific uh, concept of uh, damage. Because a wound is obviously a cutting of flesh, a bleeding, whereas a bruise is congealed blood under the skin. So Kevin would go with Ben Azai, and others would go with Rebbe. Do you get what I'm saying, Kevin? There's two ways to interpret it. That's all. Very straightforward. So that's, in essence, the argument. So again... Uh, and, one comment. This one, this one comment. Sure, this sure, sure. Forget. This Rebbe, Rebbe's argument uh, takes into account uh, like any psychological trauma that you might have from, uh, from uh, you know, without sustaining any any physical injury, whereby the other the other option doesn't doesn't allow for that. You have to have a bruise in order to go for psychiatric uh, treatment. If you need like post P, what's it P after the after the army and PTSD. Stuff. So, Gab, and I'm not. Uh, I don't want to argue with you, but the Gomorrah uses the term, and I looked at it because I also thought it was psychological in nature. It's not wasn't saying that at all. What it was saying is that there are things that are associated with a um, nerve endings and physical pain, which I suppose is psychological because it can traumatize you. But it's physical. So any of those things, I'm saying any, any, I, I'm not just, I, I just gave an example of psychological. I'm talking about anything that doesn't, any injury that you sustain that doesn't cause a bruise or a thing, like, like, you could have internal bleeding, okay, that you can't see. You could have uh, psychological problems. I'm saying any of those issues. No, I'm just saying that his option allows for that. I didn't say it is that. I said it allows for all these extra, anything that doesn't, uh, um, that can arise from not, uh, uh, even though you don't see anything on the exterior, basically. Okay, so you brought up an interesting point, which I'd like to speak to maybe Rabbi Cohen about, is that is psychological trauma from the assault something that is paid for because here we're talking about a neurological pain response that is paid for without physical uh, damage according to Rebbe and according to Ben Azai they, the neurological pain of nerve endings and damage is only assessed if there's a physical manifestation to uh, warrant such a payment so you're right but in terms of the psychological trauma it would be an interesting question on a separate note. Did in those right. days they acknowledge that sort of trauma? And the truth of it is there is, and that proof I'll be with you now, Kev, is it falls under the category of humiliation. Psychological trauma falls under humiliation. Your self-esteem, et cetera. From what I'm thinking, I might be wrong, but it would seem psychological in nature. This is a pain stimulus response and the one is saying it has to be connected to a, a, an injury that incapacitates you to where it affects your earning and the other one says no sometimes if you get your nail damaged where it's black and blue it's still not considered an injury because it doesn't devalue your market value either on the slave market or as an employee in terms of functionality so that's the other criterion Kevin, you were going to ask something. So there may be a Gavin saying the word wound. A wound could be a, a psychological wound a, a, or a physical. Maybe that the psychological wound from the, like uh, from that um, from that injury 
psychological damage, which could be as, as I say, it's that's that's what I see it maybe as. Now the word the word wound, when I look at the commentaries, is physical. They determine it as when bleeding takes place, and they consider a bruise is when there's blood congealed under the skin and there's no breaking of skin. But it's internal bleeding in nature. So a bruise is known as also internal bleeding categories, whereas a wound is something that manifests in an open um, wound to where recovery is needed. And we're going to discuss an issue of bandaging and infection and who pays for that responsibility. Those are physical in nature. The pain is the neurological stimuli response to that damaged part of your organ, um, etc. But in terms of psychological humiliation would go under it. In terms of PTSD, I wonder what category that would go under. And I wonder if they acknowledged it in those days. You know, it, 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 struck, me, it struck me, Gavin, that even in the Holocaust, people never talked about it. Suddenly when it came to Vietnam, everybody wanted to talk about feelings and the trauma of war. And in the Holocaust, people just got on with their lives and were permanently psychologically damaged. So I think acknowledging psychological damage is a relatively um, newer feature. I don't know if it was the luxury of society in those days where they even acknowledged such things. I mean, uh, you know, apart from... It's not, even, it's not even acknowledged by all. Uh, even today, it's not, they still try and they avoid it. You know, they try not to uh, delve in it too much because they don't want to pay for it. Yeah, so I think also you've got to look at this as a court case. Is is it worth taking somebody to court just for pain if you don't have injuries that would affect your earning? Would the court look at it seriously? That's also a consideration in terms of a fact as a matter of interest. So um, that's uh, so so that's the conclusion. Now the Gemara now instructs how the court should calculate the payment for pain while we're on the subject. So in other words, what we have to do is we estimate how much money a man uh, that's been put under pain wishes to take. In other words, how much would he, uh, would he be prepared to earn as a result of pain? Okay, so in other words, I know it's a weird question, but the Gemara says, listen, pain has a costing factor to it. If you had to cause somebody pain, how much pain would they take for the right amount of money? Because we need to work out how do they work out a dollar value to pain. In other words, how do we assess pain where there's permanent physical damage? So the Gomorrah is saying again that if a assailant pays the victim for uh, physical organ damage, then why should he pay for pain? Because it says he has, in essence, acquired the right to cut off the hand regardless of the pain he causes. Now, when you re read it initially from Rashi, it seems like what sort of person is allowed to create suffering? Uh, and they've almost bought the right to that person's organ if they pay the victim back. But what it's saying is since the, the victim has earned as a result, is there, in fact, extra payment for pain? And we learn that there is. So that's novel, because in a non-Jewish society, that wasn't the case. You damaged, you paid. What do you talk about pain? In the Middle Ages, they didn't look at things like that. So the Gomorrah says, okay, so let's look at who uh, purports this. The father of Shmuel said, we assess how much a person wants to take to have his hand cut off. In other words, well, what do you mean? Because the Gomorrah says, what do you mean to cut off his hand? It's not pain alone that's incurred in this thing. If you cut somebody's hand off, there are five categories that you have to pay. There's medical bills, there's recovery, there's pain, there's uh, humiliation, there's actual damage. There's a myriad of factors. So how do you isolate pain? It said it would be impossible to isolate it. And furthermore, it says, are we dealing with fools? Who's insane enough to agree to have his hand cut off? So uh, pain can't be assessed in the manner prescribed by Shmuel's father. So the Gemara says, look, Shmuel's father meant something different. Rather, we estimate how much a person would take financially to cut off his hand that is already as good as cut off. What do you mean is really as good as cut off? Is that his arm is attached to his body, but it's got smashed tendons or he's got paralysis and he's 
incapable of performing any task, according to Rashi. In other words, severing that hand wouldn't decrease the, vic uh, the victim's value as an employee or as a slave, because that hand is currently redundant. So therefore, since you wouldn't have to pay for actual damage or anything else, pain then can be worked as an isolated factor because there's no loss of income because that hand is already um, non-functional as it is. Okay? So then the Gemara said, but look, you've got the humiliation factors, Gavin said, the embarrassment, because... What normal person would want his limb removed from his flesh and thrown to the dogs? The dogs. What do you mean thrown to the dogs? It's humiliating. A person's crippled, but they're still attached to the organ. So if you say, right, I'm going to chop off your hand and feed it to the cocker spaniels and the German shepherds or the pigs, whatever, it's humiliating. So therefore, humiliation is marred and mixed in with that value of the pain. So how would you isolate where there's no humiliation by a person having his organ uh, uh, removed from him, because then it's an accurate appraisal just for pain. So the Gemara again fine-tunes the formula of what Shmuel wants to say, Shmuel's father. And Shmuel's father says, rather we assess how much a person wants to take to have his hand that is anyway inscribed to the government for amputation to cut off. To suffer the difference between amputation by potion and amputation by sword. So I thought about this. What do you mean amputation by potion? There's no sort of magic dust that I know that you sprinkle on somebody's arm and it suddenly disappears. So what are we talking about by potion? So I thought of the perfect example. Chemical castration. What they do in first world countries is for rape, if somebody's a pedophile, etc. They with the liberal America, they don't do it anymore because um, they have so much compassion for the assailant that they forget about the victims. But in any normal society, they don't want this person to serial rape children or women or girls or boys or whatever the case may be. So they chemically castrate. That's what you should know as a potion. That's what it means. In other words, it's painless, but the person is for all intents and purposes a ballerina, a eunuch, a useless tool that he's got between his legs. And in that <laughs> particular case, it's painless. So they say to him, listen, the government's uh, wanted your penis and the testicles to be chopped off with a sword, or you could have chemical castration. How much money would you pay for the chemical castration rather than a machete without an anesthetic? Now suddenly there's no humiliation because... His activity has caused the government or the king to want to have that organ chopped off. He caused it himself. There's no humiliation. So therefore, we've isolated the pain aspect. But the Gomorrah then holds in the words, and it says, what do you mean that this expression to take? Shmuel's father should have stated to give. In other words, not how much person money would a person take in order to have the chemical potion. How much would he give? as money handed over in order to avoid the pain. So he says, what do you mean to take? So the Gemara is saying, no. Rav Yehuna, the son of Rav Yeshua said, Shmuel's father means that this victim is supposed to take from the assailant what the hypothetical person would give to the government representative to save himself from the pain. So what it's saying is that... Um, According to the Gomorrah's conclusion, if the victim receives compensation for physical damage, his pain is measured by how much a person would give to save himself from such pain. And that's what the assailant gives to him. So that's pretty, that's, uh, that's pretty clear. Okay. So, um, so I think we finished on the subject of, uh, of pain. I know Gavin needs to go. I don't want to make this year any more painful than it is. <laughs> I'm having to pay money over. And Gavin, I was sensitive to the time. Okay, now you it need to. It depends where the show is. Is it in Babylon or in Israel? Where is it? I don't know. It depends. <laughs> it is in Israel. Well, in Israel. Half, to, to half the team it is, is in Israel and half the team is in Chutzlaaretz. Exactly. Yeah. It covers both hemispheres. The show covers both hemispheres of the, of the planet. Absolutely. It's, uh, we are across the globe. All right, guys, have a wonderful evening. I hope yeah, you explained yeah. it easy. All right, cheers, guys.